Welcome and hello. This is a tutorial video in EPA Swim. And in this lesson, I'm going to be discussing file management, project defaults, and calibration data. So what we're going to be doing is creating, saving, and opening a Swim project, creating a few objects, and modifying the default values, as well as an introduction to calibration data. All right, if you're following along in the user's manual, this is in Chapter 5, working with projects in the PDF version. If you are using the user's manual that's built into the SWIM pr program, you can go up to help, user's guide, and then working with projects is right here. All right, let's go ahead and get started. First things first, when you go ahead and create a project, you're going to want to go up to file and then new. Now, when you open up SWIM, it's going to start you with a new project anyway. You can also click on this button to create a new project. Now, when you save your project, you can click the save button or go up to file, save. That will open up a dialog box. So just go ahead and navigate to where on your computer you want to save that project. All right, I'm going to save my project in this directory right here. And I'm going to call it lesson four. You can call it whatever you want. It's going to save as a .inp file. Before saving, I'm going to go ahead and show you the project directory. All right, here it is, everything there. And then when I click on save, let's check out that same directory. Now I have a lesson4.inp file and a lesson4.ini file. The INP file is basically an input file. Here we have some basic project information like the flow units is in CFS. The infiltration method is Horton and so on. I'm not going to read all of this. It's pretty straightforward. Very small file because all we've done is created the project. And then the INI file is um, it's oftentimes used as a configuration file. What we see in here is a number of project information data, such as whether or not to show certain features, information about the legend, information about nodes and labels, and so on. All right, the user is really not expected to open up these files. The data in these files can also be viewed by going up to Project and then Details and then clicking on the individual data category that you're interested in. So we can check this out a little bit later in the lesson after we've uh, built a few things. All right, I'm going to start off by adding a couple elements to the map. So I'm going to start with the junction. Boom, there it is. I'm going to actually add a few junctions. So there's a few junctions. Here is a sub catchment. I'm going to go ahead and sketch out an area here, just single left clicks. And then when I'm done, right click. And I'm also going to add a conduit. So I'll just connect this junction here and then double click. I'll add a second conduit by just single click, maybe a couple nodes, a couple bends, and then a uh, Double click, all right, right click to stop editing and then save my project. Now I can go up to the project details. Now we have a few more categories you may notice. For instance, we have four junctions. We have sub catchment, just one, and then there should be a couple conduits as well. I'm going to click on the arrow icon right here to select objects. Associated with each of these objects, we now have default values. So for instance, if I right click on the sub catchment properties, I'm seeing the default values right here. If you're not sure what they mean, there is a label down below here. So for instance, when I click on area, it tells me the area of the subcatchment in acres is five. The width is the width of overland flow path in feet. That's uh, 500 feet. And then the different object types have different parameters. So this conduit, for instance, has default values of a length of 400 feet, a roughness of 0 0.01, that's referring to the Manning's N roughness coefficient, and so on. Same with the junction. We can also double click to open up that properties box. Here is the data for that junction. Let's go ahead and explore that project menu a little bit more. We were just looking at details. If I go down to defaults, now we have three tabs. There's ID labels, subcatchments, and links and nodes. If you create a subcatchment or a link or node, you're going to have some default properties based on whatever is set here in your project defaults. For instance, the ID labels right here, this applies to all of these different types of objects. Now, right now, there's no ID prefix, but you're welcome to add an ID prefix. And that means from that point on, every newly created object will be prefixed with whatever string you type in here. So right now we have conduits one and two. Let's come down to conduits and then type in a CON underscore. And then let's do one for subcatchments. I'll just make that a S. And then for junction. I'll just write out the entire word. Oh, okay, it looks like it only takes like seven characters. <laughs> let's go with J-U-N-C-T. All right, and then click OK. Now let's go ahead and add a new junction. So right there, boom. Now J-U-N-C-T-5 is the name of that new junction. Let's sketch out a second subcatchment right here. 
that is now called S6. You see that listed down here. So our subcatchment names are 5 and S6. And what's the last one? Conduit. So we'll click on Conduit. And then let's attack. Let's create a conduit right here that is now con underscore three. All right. So that's how the default naming prefix works for the different objects. I'm going to go back up to projects defaults. Now for subcatchments, what we have is the different parameters here. So area, five acres, width, that's 500 feet, percent slope, percent impervious, n imperv, and n perv is the Manning's n value for the area that is impervious and the Manning's n value for the area that is impervious. It's safe to assume that your Manning's n value for pervious will be larger than that of impervious. After that, we have D store impervious. This is the impervious area of depression storage and then pervious area of depression storage. Uh, percent zero impervious. This is the percent of impervious area with no depression storage. And the last one here is infiltration method, and that is Horton. So if you want to select a different infiltration method, just go ahead and click on the ellipse. Change the method up here. And based on the specific method, you're going to be expected to input different parameter values. Right, so that's how that works. I'm going to change a couple of values here. So instead of area of five, we'll say the default area of a subcatchment is 10 acres and the width instead of 500 feet is going to be 1000 feet and then click OK. Now, if I create another subcatchment right here, this is now labeled S7. Let's go ahead and check out the properties and make sure that those default values updated. Sure enough, we now have a default area of 10 acres and 1000 feet for the width. If you're unclear about what the units are, you can obviously look right down here. It says the width is overland flow path and feet. But another place to look at the units is if you go up to the help menu and then measurement units, boom. Here are the US customary units that are listed out here. So area is in acres. The width should be down here at the bottom. Width is in feet. And then for the conduit, uh, we're going to look at the length that's in feet. And then the Manning's end value here is actually in units of meters, even though we're using a US customary units. The Manning's end value and the concentration values right here do have metric units, even though we're using US customary units for our project. The SIE units are listed right here. You can go ahead and toggle between the two to see the difference. Also, you can use the Chevron tool to go to the next page up here. I'm in the top right, and I'm only clicking over here because there are some Manning N values here for overland flow and for uh, what looks like pipe. So here's some Manning N values, and then there's a few more Manning's N values for closed conduit and open channel. All right, so the help menu is actually really helpful. I'm going to go ahead and change a few project defaults for the conduits now. So project defaults nodes and links instead of a length of 400 feet i'll just go ahead and say that's 300 feet and then instead of a roughness of 0 0.01 i'll say it's 0 0.015 click ok let's add a new conduit now how about from here to here and then click on the arrow and then double click that conduit here are the new default length of 300 and 0 0.015 for roughness to change the project units you can come down here to flow units. Right now, the options are cubic feet per second, gallons per minute, million gallons per day. These are the three options for English units or US customary units. Down below that, we have the three options for metric units, which is uh, cubic meters per second, liters per second, and million liters per day. The choice of the flow units determines what unit system is used for all other quantities. So this units right here that we're selecting for the flow rate will actually dictate the unit system used for the entire project. It's a little bit different than some other programs. And also uh, worth mentioning is if you change the units here, it's not going to actually convert all the other data in your program. It's just going to maintain the exact same number. So for instance, we have on this conduit, a length of 300 feet. Well, if I change how many meters is that, it's going to be just under 100 meters, maybe 90 meters, right? But if I come down here and change the flow units or the entire program unit system to cubic meters per second, which means now this the program is using metric units, and then I look at the properties of that conduit, it still says 300. So now it's referring to 300 meters based on the label down here. So be careful about that. Of course, my suggestion would be to set the unit system at the beginning of the project and never touch it again. So you're not forced to making a bunch of different conversions manually. All right, next up in that project menu is calibration data. Here's the dialog box to import our calibration files. EPA SWIM can 
compare the results of a simulation with measured field data. That measured field data can be saved in a text file and referenced from the calibration data developments. So that's right here. If you happen to have data that's measured out in the field and it's saved into a text file with a specific file format, that is uh, what we need for this file reference dialog box right here. So for instance, you may happen to have measured data for subcatchment runoff, subcatchment washoff, node water depth, link flow rate, node water quality, and so on. If you happen to have, uh, we'll just pick one, node water depth. If you know what that is and it's saved into a text file, go ahead and click add, navigate to that file. It looks like it's looking for a .dat file. Then click OK, and then it'll be added here. Once it's added, you can click on Edit. That will open up that file in a notepad text editor for you to be able to make edits directly. And then you can also delete the file right here. The format of these calibration files are described in section 11.15 of the user's manual. So one second, let me just go down to the table of contents. This is the PDF here. So 11-5 calibration files. Here it talks about the different types of files. And then here it talks about the different format. This can also be viewed in the help menu. So let me just go to help, user's guide, and then files used by SWIM right here. You can expand this and then click on calibration files. And it gives you an example of what it's looking for for a calibration file right here. So for instance, every line that starts with this semicolon, that's basically like a comment. And then what you have is the list of data. This happens to be the flow through a conduit. So what we're looking at is the object identifier and then the date, time, and then value of that flow or whatever the parameter happens to be. Now there's two different ways to identify the date and time. What you're seeing here is the cumulative amount of time since the beginning of the simulation. So after zero days, zero hours, and 15 minutes into the simulation, there's a flow through conduit 1030 of zero. And then after 30 minutes, the flow is also zero. But after 45 minutes, the flow is 23.88 and then 94 and 115. Through a different conduit labeled, um, identified as 1602, then after 15 minutes, the flow is 5.76 and so on. You can read those numbers yourself. So this is the .dat data file with calibration data that should be referenced if you go up to project and calibration data. And then here is the link flow rate one right here. All right, well, that is it for this lesson. What we talked about was creating and saving project files in SWIM. We also created a few objects and modified their default values in project defaults. And then we also had a quick introduction to project calibration data.